we started doing theater in reaction in, inspired by the work of El Teatro Campesino, right? Doing Chicano theater at that time. And, um, and I know Jose Luis from a, a group called El Teatro uh, de, la, de la Esperanza and Evelina, they were El Teatro de Esperanza. Uh, many, many theater groups came out of the universities and I believe you guys came out of the UC Santa Barbara, correct? Um, and, um, and a lot of theater groups started at universities. So we were once, we were half a generation removed from the fields, let's say, from, from the from, from Delano fields. And uh, now Chicanos were going to college and forming groups. Culture Clash would be probably another five or eight years after that, after Teatro de la Esperanza. And uh, we, again, were inspired by, by these groups. But we were living in San Francisco and had a different aesthetic. It was now 1984, you know. Uh, Reagan was in uh, was it was in power. MTV was on the you know was on you know in, on um, on TV, and so we um, rock music. The comedy was big in San Francisco. So we come out of that out of that comedy scene from San Francisco. Also, the political scene. Uh, there's a group called San Francisco Mime Troupe in San Francisco that inspired us as well. So we kind of emulated those groups, San Francisco Mime Troupe, uh, of course, Teatro Campesino, Teatro Esperanza, but we had our own flavor, and that was Culture Clash, which was really about creating works about, well, satire and comedy, which nobody was doing. Everybody was doing pretty much serious political work uh, from Campesino on. Uh, we, 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 I think we got noticed because we did solely comedy in 1984. And that's when um, we made, you know, we became a comedy group. And then in 1988, we wrote our first play called The Mission, and that's really what got us into uh, the theater movement, into the theater. Prior to that, we were kind of a comedy sketch sh show. Then in 1988, we wrote our first, uh, collectively wrote our first uh, show called The Mission. And in 1990, Jose Luis brought us down to the Los Angeles Theater Center and directed the version, the LA version of the mission in Los Angeles, and that got us noticed so much so that we even got like a, a sitcom deal out of it, you know. And then the following year, we followed it up with probably our our most seminal work, which is called A Bowl of Beans, which I think is, in my mind, a, a, a Chicano classic because it, it, it's it was uh, it was I think our best work at that at that point at that point about comedy and satire. And it was uh, produced by PBS for grand performances, and so that really got us noticed. And then after that, you know, it, it, our, our life changed. What, what caused you to decide to make your platform your own theater company? It's, it was unusual in that time to start a theater company, you know, three young guys in San Francisco. Uh, out of the, a need, yeah. Out of pure need, there, nobody was writing for us, you know. We weren't getting cast at ACT, you know, in San Francisco. No one would even consider us for plays like that. Um, Lat Latinx plays were not even were not even in the theaters and re at the regionals. So you know where were we going to work? We had to write our own material. So we really wrote out of need to 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 cast ourselves, and we really wrote what we knew, you know. And so we became uh, playwrights and actors and producers and directors out of pure need, not because, because there was just no opportunities. So you've you've now been writing close to close to thirty years. You you started writing as part of Culture Clash. You're now writing most of your work solo. How have the themes, the process of the way you work, changed over that course of time? Yes, I think, like I said, I think at the beginning the work was was about us. It was about what we knew. It was very personal. It was very Latino or Chicano centric. You know, and that's those are the you know that's I think all all artists have to explore that first. Then after that, we we uh, went into docu theater for about 10, 15 years, where we went around the nation um, interviewing people. Our first play was called Radio Mambo, and that really changed our work tremendously because we were not talking about a Latino reality anymore. We were now talking about a general American reality, and that really opened the canvas for us. Let's say as actors and as, as writers. And then um, after that, we started writing what you might call a three-act structure play, you know, more structured plays, um, like Water and Power and things like that. And then um, 
And then I got a mailing grant three years ago where I became the playwright in residence here in San, in San Diego, and that you know, and it's been uh, it's allowed me to to write any type of any kind of play I want, really. You, you said when you started you couldn't get a work at ACT, right? No. Now you're doing your second Moliere adaptation. <laughs> yes. So yes, uh, yes it's weird. you're doing work that that uh, yeah, ACT did. would have done. Yes, but my but I have a Latino perspective in mind, which is very different, you know. Which has it's not your it's not your father's Moliere, let's put it that way. And you'll see that tonight. Tell us about the play we're going to see tonight and your process of creating it. I'm giving Herbert the questions early because he's in the play. He has to get into costume and, to put my and makeup hands. and prepare. Yeah. To learn his lines. It's our first preview, so you're our second audience. Yesterday we had an invited dress. Well, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I did an adaptation of Moliere called uh, the, the Imaginary Invalid. And I, I, um, I entitled it uh, Manifest Destinitis. And it, Structurally, it was the same. The only difference is I set the story in early California when the Yankees, the people, the, the people from the East were the invaders. And let's not forget that, you know, that this was Mexico only, you know, not under 200 years ago. This, well, we're sitting in Mexico. And I think people, and I have to remind people that constantly in my plays, it seems, you know. You know, people are, well, why are there so many Mexicans? Well, this was Mexico. <laughs> you know, it's that basic, you know. And, uh, you know, and uh, Manifest Destinitis is about a guy who, who's seeing, you know, Yankees coming in from the east, and he starts getting Manifest Destinitis, you know, that's his, uh, that's his uh, ill. And we had such a great time doing that play, and, you know, it resonated with, with subscribers and people, theater goers that know Moliere and know theater. And it was a very, you know, Chicano-centric play, too. So uh, I went back to the well, and... Um, I've uh, adapted A School for Wives, which is a silly little play from Moliere, but it has a great premise about a man who, who um, sends, a, sends a girl to a, a, a nunnery to get trained to be his perfect submissive wife, you know? And, you know, which is, seems ridiculous, but the premise already is ridiculous, and especially now in the, in the time of Me Too, it seems even more ridiculous. So that's good juxtaposition. And then I, I further... Um, you know, distort the story by putting it in Sinaloa, Mexico, in Sinaloa, Mexico, in 1992, at the heart of uh, uh, of narco of narco politics. And, and so, you know, it's just I like to do that. I like to just oppose, you know, Eurocentric stuff with American stuff. I like this uh, the past and present. I love things to be clashing. So it's still, I think it's it's a classic culture clash place. Still, you know, it's just written by me, so it has my flavor. But I think. I think this would have been written by Culture Clash many years ago, yeah. Cool, anything you wanna let us know about what's coming in the future? Oh, uh, well, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, really concerned about this play tonight. <laughs> Today, tonight. Um, I'm gonna get going, but I, I, I thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you after, okay? I'm, I'm gonna leave you with, like, like I said, the future, the present, and the past of Chicano Theater, so I'm really glad you guys are here. I'm really glad, these, these are like my, you know, my, my you know, when you think of Latino theater in LA, these are the guys, these are the guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, we'll good luck, Herbert, a great show. <laughs> Jose Luis, I wonder if you could follow up on what Herbert said about the way uh, Latino theater developed from Luis Valdez in the 60s. Uh, take us to the place where you came on the scene, what you were thinking about, you're still at the forefront of the scene, so how do you see uh, Latin, Latinx work changing over time? Yeah, that's complicated. But yeah, no, I came in the scene in the 70s, uh, 1970, 1971, uh, with another company before the Teatro de Esperanza, it was called Teatro de la Gente in San Jose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came from Mexico, and I had no idea there were Mexicans in the United States. <coughs> and, the, and I had no idea what the perception of Mexicans were in the United States, because I came from Mexico City which is one of the most sophisticated cities in the world. And sadly, you know, that was a whole stereotype of Mexican supposed to be. So I got involved in political theater and, and Chicano theater, especially for many, many long. Uh, 
And then I moved to LA because my wife was from LA and she said, either you go with me or you stay. So I followed. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they had all the good wives. Eh? And, and, uh, and, and, and so we started the Latino theater company there and then we were working inside a theater like this. It was called Los Angeles Theater Center. Yes. Uh, and we brought cultural cars, we brought Latin Synonymous, we, the Latino Theater Company, created place. But in the same kind of idea of political theater after that, understanding that we're not playwrights, we really, uh, meaning it was Luis Valdez, the only writer who was writing Chicano theater. And most of the companies were groups collectively writing this. And not until really the first, there were Carlos, Carlos, what's his name? Carlos, no, Morton, Carlos Morton, and, and Carlos Morton, she's a PhD, yeah, and Estela Portillo were the first two writers who came. Carlos Morton had gone to get an MFA here in San Diego, and Estela Portillo was a novelist. And those are the really first two playwrights who actually began to write about Latinos in the United States. And then uh, by the 80s, there was a whole new group of writers that came up, you know, with Mincha, Mincha Sanchez-Scott, uh, Jose Rivera, Eduardo Machado, and they were not necessarily the same type of things that we were doing, but they were Latino writers, and that began to get more attention in the, in the mainstream theater, in the regional theaters. Uh, now, I, you know, it, it, it's, 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 we continue doing the same work as Herbert's doing the same. The same, you know what I mean, the still uh, the Latino theater company continue doing the same work. I think there is more openings and more performances now going on in the regional theaters. <coughs> uh, and you have more writers like Octavio Solis and Karen Zacarias and Luis Alfaro. You know, they're being much more produced in the regional theaters uh, at this time. I think it's changing. I mean, the question now is, you know, it, it's a really, it, it, it's a contributing to the actual real dialogue that it needs to exist in the American theater and its diversity and how the transformation of the culture and its diversity is working. And I think that's the question, it is the question for us as artists, for us as Latinos, you know, how do we participate in that dialogue and how we move the American theater forward? And that's part of where, that's where I think we are right now. Uh, Evelina, uh, as you've, uh, I guess, transitioned into being uh, more of a writer uh, over the last several decades, what, what are you feeling is your contribution to the dialogue about uh, our culture, about America, about uh, Chicanos and Latinx in America? Well, um, we've been together, our, the Latino Theater Company has been together for 30 years. So we came up with Culture Clash. Um, we do very different theater. They do satire, they do comedy. Um, but what I write about is the US uh, Latinx experience. Um, and it's important for me to know that we have a history in the country, that we've um, experienced every single iconic era that everybody else has. Um, I, I, I think that many times we're forgotten. If you, if you think about uh, movies or plays that deal about the past, that deal with the past, many times Mexicans are excluded. Um, if you, you know, any movie about World War II, you never see any Mexicans. And, but yet, you know, we have um, great World War II uh, heroes veterans that participated in World War II. Um, my mother is born in Arizona. My grandparents are from Mexico. My mother is born in a small town, uh, Jerome, Arizona. So my mother is American. So I'm second generation American. Um, so all of my mother's stories, I grew up listening to her stories, and all of her stories are about World War II and the boys who died in World War II and the participation in World War II. But every time 
I see a movie or a television program or anything about World War II, we're invisible. So I, a lot of my work has to do with our participation in American history. So um, I began with the Mexican Trilogy. So Mexican Trilogy is about, uh, it's a hundred years of history of the United States, but, but also a hundred years of history of a family who came in at the beginning of the last century and has participated in every event that has ever happened since. Um, so, um, in the Mexican Trilogy, for example, part one is about World War II and our participation in that and a family story in that. Part two is during the Kennedy administration. So, we, we were all part of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were all, you know, part, we all experienced the death of President, the assassination of President Kennedy. You know, it's just telling American history through a uh, Latinx lens. So a lot of my work has to do with that. So it's important for me. It's important for me because it's my, it's my history as an American, and it's my history as a Mexican-American. So um, that is what I write. Thank you. Uh, Patrice, I, I wonder if you can talk about how you were influenced uh, by people that uh, were doing work earlier than you, and how that's shaped what you were doing with the uh, Latinx Festival. I mean, you're certainly uh, contributing to the mainstreaming of uh, Latinx theater in San Diego Rev and, uh, and in California, and I just loved at the last festival that you had photographs of all the Latinx playwrights, you know, the Hall of Fame surrounding the theater. Tell us about how the history of the theater here has shaped you and what you're thinking about going forward. Thank you. Um, well, my first experience of Latino theater was actually here at San Diego Rep. Uh, when I was in high school, a million years ago, I was in high school and we got free tickets through my Mecha organization to come see uh, Luis Valdez's Mummified Deer. And theater had always been this cool thing, but never really told my story or connected with my family in any way. And being able to see Mama Fight Deer and have a Yaki story represented on the stage was revolutionary. For, me. for my story to hold weight, to be in an audience of people who put value in that story, really allowed me to see that theater can be a tool in which we can connect together as a community that Latino perspectives are part of that community, an integral part of the US story. Um, so my work on the festival really dovetails with that, with that very first experience with Latino theater. I use the festival as a way to, again, demonstrate the integrity of, theater, of Latino theater. Um, the timeline was a new addition to our festival this year, and we only had 14, uh, we only had the ability to post 14 photos in the theater, but to the, the skills and the demonstration of the history, we had to call down the list. We had like 50 people on the list, and then we said, okay, well, how are we gonna pick only 14? I look forward to next year where we can, again, we'll have more funding so that we can add more to the, the panels, so that we can grow that list. The festival is a wonderful contribution that the San Diego Rep supports and that the San Diego Rep helps to um, add to this national conversation about what Latino theater is. We get 90 submissions annually. This is our third year. Each year we get more and more new submissions and we read all of these plays and select only four. It's an incredibly difficult task to narrow down to just four plays. We're in this era right now, an era of resurgence, an era of flowering of Latino theater. There are so many incredible playwrights across the US. It really speaks to the depth of the work that um, Evelina and Jose Luis contributed and can still still continue to contribute to the field, the, the breadth of the voices that we get to represent on our stages. Wow. What do you, uh, Jose Luis, as an artistic director uh, of a theater, what are, what are you looking for as you program uh, pieces? And clearly we're in a time where um, 
cultural identity and uh, Mexican American identity is a political question, and how are you dealing with that in the theater? Well, it's uh, interesting. I, I write a letter to my children every morning uh, for many, many years, and today's letter was about uh, you know I did a we did a play in 1977, 78 called La Victima, which is about immigration, and it's a play that we did. We were young. We play all the roles. And, we went to community centers and we do it, did it in, in colleges, wherever. It, had, it was not a very complicated, it was no set, it was no lights, it was no sound. We did everything. So right now, uh, we are rehearsing that play as a response to what's going on. And I'm doing it with young people. I'm doing, we're doing it with people from UCLA. The university because I'm a professor there and also from East LA College. And, 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 and the letter today was about how I felt like I'm going back 50 years. You know, that I feel like I have to go back and go back into the community. I have theater and I can produce the play with Professor Lactos and Nilis and so, but what it means, my community will have to pay. We have to buy tickets. We have to drive, we have to park, we have to, you know what I mean? It, it's an expense with the play. The purpose, of course, was to talk to the community. So uh, it, it, it was interesting to me to critique this morning about how maybe that's where we are. Maybe, especially for my children, they're more actors, trying to explain to them that, you know, maybe you as young people have to take the responsibility, you know, again, to go back into the streets. Uh, our community is terrorized, our community is afraid, our community doesn't want to gather. Uh, yes, because what happened in El Paso. Yes, because what's going on. And I think being in a play, they will never be threatened by a play. They may be able to gather in a play and have a dialogue of what's going on. You know, so I, I'm very conflicted. And, and, and of course, I have to program the theater and, and, and program the theater for people to come. And you know, and they have to, we have to sustain the theater and, and, and try to create um, titles or, or, or performers who are talking to the community. That's the main issue. The idea that uh, we live in. in, in, in horrible times, it, or at least our community, because you're not at the beginning, it, it's so even difficult to understand what it means to be a dog and how it feels that it's going to be a dog meaning the big fear that these people are living and how they're not even, you know, it's it, 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 terrible. If some of you you know, I'm thinking, you know, again, you know, what we're doing in the Jewish community, and how they're doing, how they have a guy, and how they can do like who they are, and how it's right that to be seen, and to die for what they are. So this is where all the community is going. I talk to politicians about what we're doing, and they say, well, we call for meetings to give them information, and nobody shows up. Of course nobody does. Nobody's going to come and say, I'm a documentary. You're not registered. Of course not. So I, I, I'm conflicted about that. I think it's a very amazing historical moment in the theater for at the Latino theater in the United States. Evelyn, how, how, is it, how are you as an artist responding to this moment? Um, we had our annual day of the day, and um, we honored a, a very important uh, person in our community. His name is Tomas Sainz. Tomas is the leader of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. And um, when he went up to give his speech, he said something very important. He said, we're living in very difficult times for our community, and we are. We are. Um, I mean, I'm a second generation uh, American, but even I can be stopped when I'm driving back to Los Angeles tonight. I could be stopped, I could be asked, I could be targeted, and that's what's happening, you know, to our community now. And so what he said is, 
So doing Latino, Latinx uh, theater right now is revolutionary. It's important. It's, it's, it's revolutionary because we have to tell our stories. We have to tell our stories and it's more important now than ever. You know, even if it's satire, even if it's comedy, even if it's drama, it's, it's, it's so important for us right now to tell our stories and say, hey, we have stories. Hey, we're human beings. Hey, we have something to say. You know, and so that's kind of how I'm reacting at this time. Um, I just did a play called The Mother of Henry, which is about 1968. Again, we did live through 1968 and the assassinations that we went through as a country. 1968 was a difficult year for our country. People were being assassinated. That hasn't happened in, in a long time. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. You know, those were difficult times for this country. We got through it. And um, I feel like we're gonna get through these difficult times too. I mean, I have to be hopeful. As, as an American and as a Mexican woman, I have to be hopeful that I believe in, in who we are as a country. I mean, I, I believe that we're gonna get beyond this. It's an ugly time. Regardless of, of what side you're on, it's an ugly time for everybody. You know, we're all feeling like, what is going on? Who are we as a country? And how are we being seen, you know, throughout the, the globe, right? So that's how I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling like I have to keep telling the stories. It's really, really important. It's, it's interesting how, you know, for us as theater artists, that the times, they, they affirm to us the importance of having live theater, live dialogue, live issues. You know, even though you've been, we've all been doing it for so many years, it's as necessary as it's ever been. Uh, Patrice, how, you've worked on this production, which uh, is a comedy. Uh, could you talk about how Culture Clash and Herbert and their process of working has affected you as an artistic director, as an artist. How the process of Herbert as a player has affected me as an artist. Oh, great question. Um, so Herbert is a very iterative writer. He likes to go through multiple drafts. Um, I got to work with him on Manifest Destinitis. And by the time we opened on Manifest Destinitis, I think we were on draft. 39. Oh, you're only on 21 of this play. Yes, we're only on 21, so we're getting faster as we go. Um, it's been wonderful to have that insight, to be in the space with the playwright as you're working a new play is such a gift. Um, so when there's a joke or a beat that we're working on in the scene or in that rehearsal that day, if something's not landing, it can be a number of reasons why it's not landing. Is it the acting? Is it the dialogue? Is it the staging? What's happening there? To have the playwright in the space with you, you get to play around with all the variables in that moment. When the playwright's not there, you don't have that freedom. You're pretty locked into the words of the playwright. And so it's a gift to be able to see and have Herbert change and shape the text as you're there with him. As an artist, it's it's great to be able to observe his flexibility and his willingness to collaborate. Herbert is an incredibly compassionate artist and is often uh, encourages others to share their thoughts with him. What did you think about this joke? What did you think about this line? Is, do you have any perspective on this? He's very welcoming. And I think that's something that I am taking from him as an artist, to be able to listen to others in the space, to be able to hear the opinions or the thoughts of others, to sit with them for a little bit, to see if they work for you, and to keep the ones you want to keep and let go of the ones that you don't want to keep. Yeah, his history of coming from a collaborative theater group makes him probably the most collaborative theater artist I've ever seen. And, you know, I, on Picasso, there are jokes in there that came from the set designer, do you know? He just draws from everything around him. There's a joke you're going to hear in the, the show tonight, one that I'm very proud of because it's very not me. 
Um, it's a very anti-feminist line, and I was surprised that it came from my mouth, but I was so encouraged to see um, everyone's reactions to it. I don't want to spoil it. It's a pleasure. Uh, we have a little time to take some questions. You have such distinguished guests today. I wonder if uh, there's anything you'd like to ask. If, you, if it's possible, could you use this mic? I was just wondering, there's a play in La Jolla called Kiss My Aztec. Does that fit into what you people are saying? Yeah, I believe Kiss My Aztec would qualify as a Latinx play. I did get to see it up at the Playhouse. It's written by uh, John Leguizamo. So it, we, there's sort of, it, yeah, it, um, Tony Taconi and John Leguizamo wrote it together. And there's kind of a, a little bit of a uh, discussion on what qualifies as a Latinx play. Generally, if the playwright or the artistic creators identify as Latinx, it counts. And John Leguizamo identifies as Latinx, and so we're like, okay, that's on the camp. <laughs> we haven't seen it. We're planning on seeing it this week. <laughs> Mexican history for dummies or something? Which is yeah, also a John Leguizamo. It's the same playwright. Same playwright. Same playwright. There's two shows. There's two shows going on. One at Yamansen and one at La Jolla Playhouse. Yes, it's very funny. It's also available on Netflix, I think, if you want to check it out. Other questions? Thank you. Good. One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Question, um, just for everyone. Um, be curious to know what your next project is that you're working on. Do you want to just go down the road? Well, I have a show that just opened in Chicago, which is a part two of the Mexican trilogy, the part that takes place during the Kennedy um, administration. And I have uh, the commission for South Coast Repertory Theater. And um, we do... Um, a holiday pageant play at Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral every year. This is our 17th year. So I wrote it, and it's a, it's a beautiful pageant play. It's about uh, the four apparitions of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And it, it's a huge uh, cast of over 100 people. Community people are in it. Like if any of you wanted to be in the show, you could be. Um, and um, we have a chorus of community people. We have children, seniors, musicians. Uh, this year it's December 6th and 7th at our late Lady of the Angels Cathedral um, in downtown Los Angeles. It's free. Um, but if you want reserved seating, that's also available on our website, LATCW. I hope you, I, I wish, I mean, I don't know if you guys ever go to LA for theater, but if you do, it's just a beautiful experience. That is a great invitation. Jose Luis? Like I say, I'm doing La Victima, I'm doing another play that's going on tour called The, the Last Angry Brown Card, going to Chicago next week or the middle of November, uh, I'm doing La Virgen. Uh, and then I did uh, another play called uh, Destiny of Desire by Karen Zacarias uh, that's going to be Star rehearsals in January in Cincinnati and then it goes to Milwaukee to the Milwaukee Rep and it goes to the Gatry. Uh, and that's what I'm doing for the next six months. Uh, you know. And then we're developing a new play that she uh, uh, wrote for the fall, uh, it's called Sleep with the Angels, which is uh, an amazing, I call it, it's an adaptation of Mary Poppins, but she's undocumented. <laughs> it's really cool, it's beautiful. We just did a, a reading of it, and now that's gonna be produced in the fall. And then I have a play, and uh, it's playing at the OSF right now, uh, the Scottish play, uh, we can say the name of the theatre, but it's playing at, at OSF, if you guys want to see it, go, it's, uh, have you gone to OSF, it's this weekend, uh, that's, that's what I'm doing, so I'm going to get to see it. What an incredible amount of work you both have.
stuff going on. And yeah, and it, is a, it, it is the season of the LATC, which is open next week. You know, with Marta Carrasco from Spain, I Nobody's Bitch, is the name of the play, La Perro de Nadie. And then, and then Jose Torres Tama with immigrants, doers, they uh, are immigrants. Of people doers. So we have all these things going on in our life right now. So we're very honored to be here to see. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Patrice, what did you come up with? Um, so next up for me, I'm directing in the WOW Festival. Um, at Stonebury, and then directing a workshop of Dreamhouse, uh, a play that was featured in our festival at, uh, this year, and then prepping for the festival next year, reading a ton of so thank you so much for joining us today. I know you'll enjoy the show. And thank you to our guests, Evelina Fernandez, Jose Luis Valenzuela, and Dr. Patrice Amen. Thank you so much for being wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.